Here it is, Job 17.16. We ready? Job 17.16. Does the Old Testament know of the underworld, also called the netherworld, also the abode of the dead? Job 17.16. They shall go down to the bars of the pit when our rest together is in the dust. There's the pit. There's the pit, all right? A couple more references. Some of them are quite lengthy, so I'm trying to give you the ones that are not, and I'll come back to the lengthy ones. Pay attention. Notice the repeated references to the pit. Okay, John, come watch the rest of it later, brother. Psalm 55, 22 to 23. Psalm 55, 22 to 23. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, Yahuwah, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction, who, bloody and deceitful men, shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. That is a clear reference to punishment. If he's talking about the grave, well, both the righteous and the wicked go to the grave. Something more is involved here. The pit can't be the common grave because he's contrasting the fate of the wicked with the righteous. If the pit is referring to the grave, well, all of us go to the grave, right? Everyone with me there? All of us go to the grave, correct? Are you seeing it? The pit that the wicked and bloodthirsty men go down to must be something other than the grave because it's a punishment for the wicked, not for the righteous. Here, one more time. The righteous shall not be moved, but thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Okay, you see? There you go. Now let's look at some other references. Psalm 69, 15. Psalm 69, 15. And then I'm going to quote some of the lengthier ones. Psalm 69, 15. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit Shut her mouth upon me. See, that's the fate of the wicked. So God, he's crying out, Lord, forgive me. Save me from this fate. Save me from this fate. I'm going to have to start quoting some of the lengthier ones, but hold on. Let me go to the ones that are not as lengthy, and you're going to see a pattern. I'm not going to quote all of it, but it give you just a sampling to give you an idea. And I'll quote some of the most explicit ones. Psalm 140, verses 9 to 11. Psalm 140, verses 9 to 11. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. This is talking about the fate of the wicked who don't repent. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Can it be any clearer, dude? Can it be any clearer that he's referring to hell? Cast into the fire, into deep pits. That they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. Could it be any clearer? Are you guys getting it? I'm going to go slow. It's all in my articles. I'm not going to quote all of them, but a sampling of them. Could it be any clearer? The Old Testament shows awareness of a painful judgment for the wicked. Beyond this life. All right, now. Now watch here. If you want to really know that the pit is not some common grave, look at here. Psalm 143, verse 7. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. You caught it? If the pit is a common grave, why is he asking, don't make me like those that go into the pit? Thank you, sir. Even if you disagree with me, at least hear me out, and then you separate me from the chaff. You don't need to debate me. I appreciate you willing to hear. You guys see it? Are you seeing it? All right. A few more. I got there. One's more. They're even more clear. All right. Now notice a distinction between the grave and the pit. Watch here. 
Proverbs 1, 10 to 12. Proverbs 1, 10 to 12. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, killing innocent people. Let us lurk privily, privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. You, you see, not only the grave, but the pit. Because when you die and go to grave, you go to the pit, right? Not because they're one and the same, but because why do you die? Contrary to what some people teach, soul sleep, your spirit leaves your body. So your body goes one way, your spirit goes elsewhere. And I'll confirm that a little more. Everyone with me there? Nicola, please, let's focus on the topic. You guys keep bringing up questions not related. Let's focus on the topic. What you experience here on earth will be pale in comparison to the hell to come. Okay. Okay, now, let's continue. This is the one I want to quote because it's quite lengthy. Let me go there. Let me see. Hmm. All right, here you go. This one is lengthy. It's about Lucifer. Are you ready now? Lucifer, are we ready? Okay, let's go here. Watch here. Tell me if this doesn't sound like the underworld, the netherworld. Isaiah 14, it's a lengthy one, verses 9 to 21. I got to quote all of it. So bear with me, guys. I won't be quoting too many. It's all there. Isaiah 14, 9 to 21. Watch here, guys. Okay. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. The word is Sheol. Greek, it's Hades, Hades. And the King James rendered as hell. Notice this place is a place where there are people there who are conscious. They're consciously alive here. Watch the description. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised them up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and send to thee. When you go down there where everyone is, even the wicked kings like you, whom you killed, right? And you ended up experiencing the same fate as them. They look at you and say, art thou, are you the one? You become like us, weak like us? Because over here in Hades, in Sheol, in the underworld, we're all the same. No one has an advantage over someone else. So now you're just like us, huh? Powerless and weak. Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp, your arrogance is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee. Now it's talking about his body. Your body is now covered with worms. And here you are with us. And the worms cover thee. Do you notice there's two parts to him? The body that's covered with worms in the grave. And him coming down to Hades and Sheol. Where the others are there. Looking at him astonished. So you're nothing, huh? You're just as powerless and weak like us. Are we getting it or no? We got that? Are you sure you're getting this? I want to make sure you're getting it. Because I want to now continue the rest of it. And there's a lengthy one in Ezekiel as well. I got to read these. Because these are really clear. Okay, now watch who this is. Get ready. Watch who this is. Watch here. Isaiah 14, 9, all the way to 21. Let's go watch here. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? This is the passage where we quote about the fall of Satan. If you read its immediate context, let me explain what's going on here. See, you guys want me to go in depth, right? You don't want kid stuff. You want in depth. If the Holy Spirit enables me to go in-depth by the wisdom illumination he provides, because he's the teacher. Exactly, Sean. I love what you said, brother. I'll pin it in a minute. It's almost like God wanted to leave no doubt. Okay? All right. If you read Isaiah 14 from 3 to 23, it talks about the king of Babylon. So it's talking about the human king of Babylon being destroyed. But remember what the Bible teaches. If you read Daniel 10, verse 13, 
Daniel 10, 20 to 21, you will note that behind every human ruler is a spirit being, a spirit authority, a spirit king working in and through the human ruler. All right? So when you speak of a human king, you also speak of the spirit working in and through him, empowering him, because the human rulers are actually the puppets being controlled and influenced by the spirit rulers. That's why in Ephesians 6, 12 says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, authorities, principalities, dominions in the heavenly realm. Are you with me there? So though it's addressing the king of Babylon, mm -hmm. it can also be referring to the spirit empowering him and working through him. Right? So that's how you can say it's Satan. On a surface level reading, it's not Satan. It's about the king of Babylon who in his arrogance thinks he's a god and he wants to rival God and make himself higher than everyone else equal to God. Because it was a common feature among ancient Near Eastern kings. They all thought they were gods on earth. Did you know this? If you look at the ancient Near Eastern empires, all human rulers thought they were actually sired by a god and a human, or a goddess and a human, they thought they were hybrids, gods, humans. They thought they were gods on earth. They thought they were more than human, they were divine. That was a common feature. It was only the king of Israel who didn't think that he was God. Did you know that? Pharaohs thought they were gods. Babylonians, Assyrians, they all thought they were gods. Persians, they thought they were gods. And they actually thought that the gods sired them in some way. In fact, how many of you know the epics of Gilgamesh? Dream, I'll get to that in a minute. How many of you know the epics of Gilgamesh? Where after the flood, the fifth king of Uruk was Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh was supposedly the son of Ninirga, a goddess who got pregnant with him by one of her male priests. So her male priest and her had sex, and she sired Gelgemish. He was the son of Ninirga, the fifth king of Uruk after the flood. You get it? They all thought they were the hybrids of gods and humans, again reflecting the accuracy of the Bible. Because the Bible talks about that. Now, why is that amazing? What was the first lie of Satan, the serpent, to Adam and Eve? You who are rulers of the world. Pay attention, brethren. Mr. Ouch, thank the Holy Spirit. Weren't Adam and Eve called to rule the world? To rule on behalf of God over the world? The world was subject to their dominion and authority? Everything had to obey them as long as they served God? It is. It is a great piece of literature. Right? You remember that? So here are the human rulers who are tempted to be gods. So this is one of the ancient lies of the serpent. That you humans are gods in human form called to rule. Because he's taking that lie that he used to tempt Adam and Eve. They were human rulers bearing God's image called to serve God and subject themselves to his authority and headship and be his visible representatives on earth, ruling the world on his behalf. But they wanted more. They wanted to be their own gods. You see how this is the ancient lie of the serpent being multiplied and displayed before your very eyes among all these kings? You caught what's going on here, right? So in Isaiah 14, the king of Babylon thinks he's a god on earth. Well, the reason why I think that, because the Bible says that the kingdoms have been divided and they have spirit rulers assigned over them, working in and through them for destruction to oppose God. Right? Why do you think in the ancient Near Eastern cultures, the serpent is viewed as a savior god? Did you know that? Here's where you're going to see why the Bible is shocking. Are you aware that in the ancient Near Eastern pagan cults, 
they worshiped the serpent and they viewed him as a savior God because he brought them knowledge. It's the Bible that says the serpent was evil and didn't bring knowledge, but death and destruction and rebellion. You guys aware of this? You see what the Bible is doing, right? The Bible is actually giving you the true version of these historical events. These events will mention the flood. They'll mention the serpent. They'll mention the tree. But they will speak of the serpent as a savior God who helped man attain enlightenment and immortality. Right? And if you read these myths, they tell you that, you know why the, the flood occurred? This is in the epics of Gilgamesh, as well as in the Enuma Elish. You know why they flooded the earth? You want to see how stupid these myths are? Did you know why they flooded the earth? You, I'm not lying. You think I'm lying. Can you can you Google this and confirm? Enlil, Enki, Ia, Anu. Because the, the humans were too noisy. They were making too much noise on earth, upsetting the gods, and they decided to then flood the earth. Can you guys Google it? Because it's been a while. I haven't read it. But I thank the Lord for giving me recall. That was the reason. Did you know that? They were making too much noise, upsetting the gods and goddesses, and decided to flood. But then Enki appeared because they had made an oath not to tell the human beings. They made an oath. So what did Enki do? He went to the house of Utnapushtim, and he pretended to be talking aloud. And Utnapushtim was hearing him. And as he's talking aloud to himself, he goes, the gods have decided to flood the earth. So the way to save mankind is build a ship and embark on it. Because he had taken an oath that they would not reveal to human beings the plan of the gods and goddesses to flood them and destroy them. Did you know that? Guys, can you Google it before I move on? By, by the way, I hope you're enjoying these sessions as much as I enjoy the use of the Holy Spirit to teach you these things. What a contrast to the Bible. What a contrast to the true version of events. So when someone tells you, well, hold on. Uh, the story of the flood comes from the epics of Gilgamesh. No, it doesn't. And Umala, no, it doesn't. What these stories confirm, what these stories confirm is that the flood is an historical fact. Why? All cultures, even like he just mentioned, Aztecs, separated by oceans, no internet. And yet all cultures have this in common. All cultures have this in common. What do they have in common? They have a flood story and a human family surviving, right? A human family surviving, a flood story, and a human family surviving, and gods and goddesses coming to the earth, cohabiting with humans, and teaching them advanced knowledge. Right? Why? Because these are historical facts that occurred. And when Noah's descendants spread all over the world, they took this information, they took this story with them, and they taught it to generation after generation. But in time, the stories became embellished and changed. So this actually proves these events occurred because they're widespread and universal and known all over the world. Well, how do you explain that? Because they happened. That's why continents separated by oceans who have no way of contacting each other via email all have flood stories, gods and goddesses coming to the earth, helping man advance and cohabiting with human beings because these events were known and occurred and the descendants of Noah took the stories with them and spread them all over the world. Are you with me there? So what does the Bible do? It gives you the true version of these events. So no, 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 no. That's an embellishment. No, no, no. It didn't happen this way. No, no, no. That's a perversion. It happened, but here's how it happened. And how do we know? The Bible is the true version of these events. Thank you, brother. How do we know? Because Jesus died, rose again, conquering death, sin, and Satan. 
never to die again. And he confirmed the Old Testament, not the epics of Gilgamesh. Because a myth is something that has a kernel of historical truth, something that happened and then became embellished throughout time. See? Do you see the massive, overwhelming amount of evidence God has given you that these events are real? They're historical. They happen. So if you want to know which version is true, the Old Testament version, why? Because Jesus confirmed the Old Testament, not epics of Gilgamesh. When someone else leaves the tomb empty and rises and never die again, then I'll give him a hearing. But Jesus conquered death, rose immortally in flesh, never to die again. And he says, Old Testament is true. You get it now? Okay, so what are you learning here? What are you learning here? You're learning the Bible is revolutionary in its historical cultural context. See, because you guys have been depaganized, you don't understand how revolutionary, remarkable, mind-blowing the Old Testament was in light of its ancient Near Eastern historical culture. Because it's turning the stories of the pagans upside down. What they said was good, a serpent, who enlightened mankind unto immortality. So he's a savior God to be worshipped. The Old Testament says, no, he's wicked and evil, and he's the cause of death, right? What they said were powers in the skies, sun and moon, stars. Genesis says, no, they're nothing but inanimate objects that are powerless, whom God created with ease, effortlessly, and are under his control. Even the Sabbath day was unheard of and revolutionary in, its, in light of its historical cultural context. Don't take my word for it. If you look at how the ancient Near Eastern people treated people, servants, slaves broke their back day in and day out, no rest. And you see that in the story of the Israelites. Here God comes and it says, no, you must have a day of rest. It was revolutionary in light of its historical cultural context. Things we don't know because we've been depaganized. So we don't appreciate how amazing and revolutionary the Old Testament was in light of its ancient, historical, pagan, cultural background. Do you guys know that? Everyone got it? I'm not exaggerating. Why do you think in Genesis 1, God doesn't mention the sun and moon by name? He just says, let there be lights. Because the sun and moon were worshipped as deities. And Genesis speaks of them as powerless, inanimate objects that God effortlessly, with ease, brought into being and controls because they are not gods or goddesses. And they are not powers to be worshipped. They are objects created by God for the benefit of man. They were meant to serve you, not you serve them. That's what Genesis 1 is all about. Not, I'm not exaggerating, brethren. Are you getting this? Is it making sense? Because I don't want to move on if you're not getting it. It was revolutionary. If you then see it from it, you're like, wow. This book really stu stood out like a sore thumb. It opposed what they were saying. The serpent is evil. What do you mean? It's In fact, in the story of the epic of Gilgamesh, you have a story where Gilgamesh meets Utnapushtim, who's supposed to be the Noah of that epic. And he wants to find immortality because his friend Ankito, who was a man raised among animals, and he was a beast, like Bigfoot, very hairy, whom Gilgamesh tamed and they became best of friends. They went to war and the pagan goddess, I believe was Eshtar, shot and keto and wounded him and he died and Gilgamesh was heartbroken and so he went to Napushtim trying to find the antidote to death so Napushtim told him go here and you're going to find a plant that plant is the plant of immortality but it says that Napushtim when he I'm sorry when Gilgamesh found it he went to bathe in a pond and unbeknownst to him, as he left that plant, a serpent came and ate it, which is why the serpents keep 
casting their skin because of that plant that the serpent ate, which allows them to live longer lives. It sheds its skin because of that. And Gilgamesh was irate and heartbroken and upset that the serpent ate the plant that he wanted to bring in order to cure Ankito of death. Now, guys, can you fact check me? Because I remember it was a plant eaten by a serpent. And that's how they explain that a serpent sheds its skin because it's being renewed so it can live longer. It was an interesting story. When I read it years ago, I was fascinated by it. You want me to give you a little more details about Ankito and Gilgamesh? And by the way, they are two famous names among Assyrians. There are a lot of Assyrians that name their children Gilgamesh and Ankido. Okay. Do you want me to tell you how Ankido and Gilgamesh became tamed? Or Gil uh, Ankido became tamed and they became best of friends? You guys want me to give you a little more details? I thank the Holy Spirit for enabling me to call the facts. Correct me on the spot for your glory. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. Ankido used to set animals free from the snares of hunters. The story goes like this. And Keto was a man, but he was raised among the animals and he was very hairy, like Bigfoot. Bigfoot is modeled after him. I'm not lying. Whenever they would go hunt and put traps, and Keto would come and set the animals free. The hunters got livid. They got angry. So they went to Galgamesh and said, hey, you got to do something about this, this beastly man. So what Galgamesh did was he sent a woman to tame him, to have sex with him. This is in the story. So she enticed Ankito, had sex with him, and then the animals, when they sniffed him, they smelled the scent of a human, became afraid of him, and ran from him. So they were no longer comfortable in his presence. Now, that woman brought Ankito to Gilgamesh. Okay, now watch what he did. Gilgamesh was pretty much undefeatable. No one could beat him. Why? Because his mother was a goddess. So he had the power of the gods. And he would beat everyone in fight. He was like the Bruce Lee of his time. True story. When I say true story, as far as the myth goes, giving you details of the myth. Gilgamesh used to do something very wicked. On the night when a person was to marry his virgin bride, he made it a custom that you would bring your bride to Gilgamesh and he would deflower her for you and he would send her back no longer a virgin. That's in the <laughs> epics of Gilgamesh. That's what he would do. Did you know that? So if I got married, he made it a custom. I had to bring my wife to him. He would deflower and sleep with her first. If not, I'd be punished and people hated him for it. So the story goes that when Ankito arrived, he saw Gilgamesh wanting to take a man's bride and he attacked Gilgamesh and they fought tooth and nail and it ended up in a draw and Gilgamesh fell in love with him because he was the first man that Gilgamesh could not de defeat and he was the first man that was equal to Gilgamesh in power. And when he saw him, that man... This guy's my equal. I couldn't defeat him. He couldn't defeat me. He fell in love with Ankito and became his best friend. And they went hunting and they went to declare war together. Everyone got it? Now, guys, can you do me a favor? Fact check me. Go to Google and put this in. This is a story of the epics of Gilgamesh. Right? Is he? Hmm. All right. I didn't know that. But this is the story of the epics, the epic of Gilgamesh. This is the story. This is what you find in the tablets that they discovered. That's the story of Gilgamesh. Now, what has this got to do with Isaiah 14? I know you thought I forgot. I didn't forget. Okay. What has that got to do with Isaiah 14? Well, as you see, this custom of the pagan rulers thinking they're gods on earth <clears throat> traces itself to the garden and the serpent. 
when he tempted Adam and Eve, the first human couple and the first human rulers created by God to rule over all of physical creation, were tempted to be gods in derogation of the true God. So that lie continued among the ancients. And the Bible then teaches behind every human ruler, there's a spirit power working in and through him. So the real ruler is not the human ruler, but the spirit ruler that's using the human ruler as his vehicle. So when you read Isaiah 14, and it talks about the king of Babylon, it can also be referring to that spirit power working in and through him. Is that clear? Do we got it? Everyone got it? Yep. Exactly, brother. That's been confirmed. So, Isaiah 14 can be speaking of the human king descending to Sheol, Hades, with the other kings that he killed. So notice they're alive, Isaiah 14, 9, 11. They're there alive in Sheol. And then it goes and speaks of someone else. Or speaking about the spirit possessing the king of Babylon. It's possible. All right. Now let's read it. Let's read the rest of it. You ready? I hope you're enjoying this. This is why it takes me multiple parts to do justice to these topics. Yep, Xerxes was one of them, Ahasuerus. Yep. Here it is, Isaiah 14, 9 to 21. We're picking up at 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. There you go. Notice it's pit and sheol. This is the punishment of Lucifer. Are you going to tell me that sheol means the grave? Are you seriously going to tell me that Sheol means the grave or that Sheol means hell, the pit, hell and the pit, the punishment of the wicked who are damned? What say you? Everyone got it? Is it obvious that here Sheol cannot mean the grave because it's talking about Lucifer wants to be a god and God will strike him dead? And he's going to go down to Sheol and to the pit. And then Isaiah 14, 9 to 11, we're told that those in Sheol, those are the kings, the pagan rulers who are also killed. And they're alive and conscious. And when they see Babylon come down, you too? Is it all making sense? Now, how many of you were not aware of how much proof there is in the Old Testament for the netherworld, the underworld, the afterlife, and punishment beyond the grave. How many of you are not aware of this? Is there a few more references to this? And then we'll see how much time I spent. Yep. We'll go into, if we have time, or we'll do a part three. When you say physical, I don't even know what you mean, physical. Because if you're a spirit and your body leaves your, your spirit leaves your body, then you're entering into an actual dimension an actual place, but that place is not made of the same stuff that the earth is. So I don't know what you mean by physical, so I can't answer it. Right? Everyone getting it? FYI, this is a fact. Did you know the belief that there is life beyond death, beyond the grave, was widespread and universal among all cultures? This notion of soul sleep, you won't even find it attested in these cultures. These cultures, Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, the Greeks, all knew that when you died, your soul leaves your body and you go to the underworld. Do you know that? It was widespread. The notion of soul sleep, that is actually novel and new. 
Are you with me there? That is novel and new. All cultures. Why do you think they would have the right of passage? They would have funeral rites in order to make the passage of the soul of the dead enter into the next realm with ease. Like they would put coins on the eyes of the Greeks who were slain so that the boatman would come and they would have money to pay for the ride, the ferry ride to Hades. I don't know who you're talking about. Doubt that. So sleep. Living. I hope you're not saying you doubt me, buddy, because I'm going to send you to sleep. Right? Why do you think? Have you ever seen the movie? It's taken from Homer's Iliad. It's about the Trojan War, where Hector is killed by Achilles, and the father comes and begs him for the body because they want to give him proper burial, and they want to put coins on his eyes so that the boatman, the ferry, can come and take him to Hades because they took it seriously. Yep, the Egyptians did the same thing with the dead, especially the, the pharaohs. Oh, I didn't know you guys still do that, man. Wow. Greeks still do that? So it's much more widespread than people think. Now, let me go to another lengthy passage. This is Ezekiel 28. Uh, Ezekiel 31 is another one. It's very long. But it's worth me quoting. This is a long one, brethren. And we'll have a few more snippets. And I may have to do part three because I don't know if I can get to Gehenna and Hades in this one. This is from my article, and it's Ezekiel 31, 10 to 18. Ezekiel 31, 10 to 18. Are you ready? The pit, the well, right? The netherworld, where the dead go. Are you ready? Okay. Let's begin, brethren. Let's read. Please read. Therefore, says the Lord God, Adonai Yahuwah, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, he has shot up his top among the thick bows, and his heart is lifted up in his height. I have therefore delivered him into the hand, this talking about this pagan ruler king, whom God is going to destroy, show that he's no God, of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off. Now watch. And have left him. Upon the mountains and all the valleys, his branches are fallen. And his bows are broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Now watch what happens to him when he gets killed in battle and struck down. Watch here. Okay. Okay, watch here, guys. All right, let's get there. Okay, read with me. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches, to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height. Now this is all speaking metaphorically of human kingdoms and nations as trees and bows, right? That when they see what happens to this arrogant ruler, as mighty as he is, they'll be afraid to become arrogant, lest they get humble too. Neither their trees shall stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death. Now watch. To the nether parts of the earth, in the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit. Here you go. Do you see it? The reference to the pit? Nether parts of the world. The underworld. Defeat, nether part, meaning the underworld. Let's continue. Thus saith the Lord God, Adonai Yahuwah, in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused the morning, I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. I made the nation shake at the sound of his fall, when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. There you go. Cast him to show into the pit. Now guess who's there, guys? Are you catching it? Watch now who's there okay, and what happens. Here you go. Watch here. Here you go. Let me read the rest of it. And all the trees of Eden, 
the choice in best of Lebanon. Now, this is speaking of human rulers and nations metaphorically as trees. All that drink water shall be comforted in other parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shall thou be brought down with the trees of Eden into the nether parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his multitudes, saith the Lord God. Is it making sense? Okay. Here's the next part of this. Ezekiel 32. It's a long one. 70 to 32. This is going to blow you away. It's long, brethren. We'll wrap it up in a minute. Ezekiel 32. Watch who's there in the pit in Sheol. Ezekiel 32, 17 to 32. Ezekiel 32, 17 to 32. It's long, but I got to go through it. Watch. Oh, there's no hell in the, old, in the Old Testament, Sam. There's no. All right. Okay. Here you go. Here you go. Let's read. It's long, but we got to break it down. It, come, it came to pass also in the 12th year, in the 15th day of the month, that the word of the Lord, the word of Jesus, I mean the word of the Father, because it's Jesus speaking, he's the word that comes, unto me saying, Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt, and cast them down, even her and the daughters of the famous nations, unto the nether parts of the earth, with them that go down into the pit. Whom dost thou pass in beauty? In other words, you're incomparable. There's no one like you, Pharaoh, but as great and beautiful and majestic you are, I'll make you nothing. Go down and be thou laid with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell. Say what? Those who are in hell will speak to him. Those who are in hell before him when he goes down there, they're going to be talking to him. You see it? The mighty ones, the kings who were killed and slain before him, who are in hell, they'll be speaking to him when he comes down. Out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down. They lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Now here's the Assyrians, by the way. Ashur, that means Assyrians, the land of the Assyrians, is there in all her company. His graves are about him. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, right? Whose graves are set in the sides of the pit. Now watch. I like what's going to happen here. You ready? Okay, and then we'll wrap it up. I hope you guys are not bored with this. Here you go. And her company is round about her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword which caused terror in the land of the living. See, when they were alive on earth, they terrorized people. There is Elam. This is all around Iran and Iraq. And all their multitude around about her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down uncircumcised into the nether parts of the earth, which caused their terror in the land of the living. Yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. They have set her a bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude. Her graves are round about them, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though their terror caused in the land of the living. Yet they have borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. If this is the common grave, then what's the punishment? Even the righteous go down there. But this is supposed to be their punishment and shame. Okay, now watch here. Okay, watch here, guys. We're almost done with this part. Okay, watch here. He is put in the midst of them that be slain. So who's there? Now notice who's there in the pit, in hell, in Sheol. There is Meshach, Tubal, and all her multitude. Her graves are round about him. All of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they cause their terror in the land of the living. 
and they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war, and they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquity shall be upon their bones, though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yea, thou shalt be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised, and shall shalt lie with them that are slain with the sword. There is Edom, all these mighty nations and peoples, her kings and all her princes, which with their might are laid by them that were slain by the sword. Philip, Meshach, and Tubal are your neighbors. Say hi to them. They shall lie with the uncircumcised and with them that go down to the pit. Okay? If the pit is the common grave, even the righteous go there. But this is supposed to be punishment, judgment, wrath, and humiliation. So they were killed physically and buried, but then they went down to the pit. To Sheol, hell. Now watch here, the rest of it. Okay? I may quote a few more parts. There be the princes of the north, all of them, and all the Zidonians, which are gone down with the slain. With their terror, they are ashamed of their might. And they lie uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword and bear their shame with them that go down to the pit. Pharaoh shall see them. Wait, how does he see them? Guys, can you explain that to me? How does Pharaoh see them if this is the grave? Pharaoh shall see them and shall be comforted over all his multitude. Even Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, saith the Lord God, Adonai Yehoah, for I've caused my terror in the land of the living, and he shall be laid in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain with the sword. Even Pharaoh and all his multitude saith Adonai Yehoah. How does Pharaoh see these kings who are all in the pit if the pit is not referring to the realm of the dead, the spirits of the dead who are slain, their bodies buried in graves, but their souls go there and they're conscious and they're aware of one another. So when Pharaoh goes down and says, hey, I'm not the only one, all of you suckers are here too. Are you getting it? Because I want to quote one or two more passages and wrap it up. Is it clear for you guys or no? I don't know if it is. Pharaoh will see them. In other words, when Pharaoh is slain, his body's buried, and his soul goes down, he's going to see the kings of the nations. He's going to see their multitudes there. Hey! And his, his soldiers coming down with him. Hey, we're not alone, boys. They're all here. So we're all now in the same place, even playing field. We're on the same level. No one is mightier than the other. We're all powerless and weak. Okay. Let me give you now some, one from Psalm, and then we'll end it with Daniel. I think we'll end part two here, and then we'll do a part three. A lot more in my article, but you see why Bible versions are important? The right Bible can teach you a lot. The wrong one can mislead you. I want to make a point about it, and then we're going to wrap it up. Let me just see. Let me see. Psalm 81. Here it is. Psalm 88, verses 118. This is a long one. And this and Daniel, we're going to wrap it up. Psalm 88, verses 118. Okay. I hope you learn a lot more how in-depth, how supernatural the Bible is, how deep the Bible is, and how much truth there is about the spirit realm in the Old Testament that's hidden from our eyes because of the proliferation of modern translations or scholarship that tries to de-emphasize the supernatural aspect of the Hebrew Bible. And it's clear references to the afterlife. Okay? So you ready now for the two final ones? Watch here. Psalm 88, verses 1 to 18. And then I'm going to quote Daniel, and then I'm going to make some points, and we're going to do a part three later. Okay? Watch here. O Lord God, Yahuwah, Elohim. I'll get there, Jesus is God. Just be patient. God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. Okay? 
I am counted with them that go down into the pit. Lord, I'm going down to the pit, but I'm righteous. Save me. I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. Right? And they are cut off from thy hand, meaning your provision. Now watch here, though. Now here. Here's where I want you to pay attention, please. Notice there are levels to hell and the pit. This makes sense because the Bible tells us, specific New Testament, there are degrees of punishment. That's in the New Testament. Lord willing, I'll show you that in part three. The New Testament talks about degrees and levels of punishment. So it only makes sense that the Old Testament speaks of levels of hell, levels of the pit. Here. Right here. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit. So if there's a lowest pit, there are pits that are a little higher. In darkness, in the deeps. Notice darkness. That's what Jesus said. They'll be cast out into outer darkness. Matthew 8, 12. Well, they be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They, thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. He's feeling like God is judging him for sin. Now he's confessing it, asking God to forgive him as he turns away from sin. Right? Thou hast put away mine acquaintance from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. See, so he's confessing, God, you're punishing me because of my sin, but I'm confessing, repenting, so that he can be forgiven. And he doesn't share the fate of the wicked who go down to the lowest pit in darkness. Lord, Yahweh, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Now watch. It's going to get better. Here's where it's going to get better. Watch here. Watch the reference to Abaddon, folks. I mentioned this in part one yesterday. Here it is again. Will thou show wonders to the dead? Yeah, once you're dead and you're in the pit, God is not going to do any miracles and signs to bring you to salvation. It's over. Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Those who are in the graves, they're not going to praise you for anything you do in the land of the living. Their fate is sealed. Selah. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Now watch. Or thy faithfulness in destruction? Remember this word, abaddon, brethren. Please remember it. Shall thy wonders be known in the dark? What did Jesus say? Matthew 8, 12. This place is outer darkness. And thy righteous land of forgetfulness? What does he mean, forgetfulness? When you die, all your plans, all your <clears throat> efforts to get ahead of life, forgotten. Because once you go down there, you will, you will care less about money, business, property, possessions, and pleasures. All of those will be forgotten because you'll be in a state of misery, darkness. You understand what he's saying here, brethren? Is it making sense as I wrap up? Because I got to wrap it up. Right? Yep, exactly. Thank you, Joshua. Now, let me continue reading. But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, Yahuwah, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Meaning, my prayer will cause you to turn from punishing me. Why castest, castest thou off my soul? Why hides, hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. Almost done. Now watch here. And then I'm going to show you this word abaddon. Remember he said abaddon? If you want to see proof that here it's referring to the netherworld. Remember he said abaddon? Okay. Now watch here. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together, lover and friend. Hast thou put far from me, this is the consequence of my sins and rebellion, discipline from the Lord, severe discipline, to get my attention to repent and turn and fear him and be restored so he can bless me, and my acquaintance into darkness. Now, remember this word, Abaddon. If you want proof that he's referring to the netherworld, the pit and hell. Notice this word, Abaddon. Where do we find it? Let me remind you where we found it. 
This was in Revelation 9, verses 111, but I'm just going to give you Revelation 9, 11. What is Abaddon? Here you go, Revelation 9, 11. And what is this darkness that he's talking about? Revelation 9, verse 11 from the Revised Standard Version. Let's see if you catch it. Abaddon. Who or what is Abaddon? They have a king. They have as king over them. He's talking about the bottomless pit, the Abuso. This pit where their demons chain will be unleashed for five months. They have a king over them. The inhabitants of the Abuso, the abyss, bottomless pit. The angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek he's called Apollyon, meaning destroyer, destruction. What more proof do you want that here in the Old Testament, Abaddon refers to a spirit creature, an angelic creature, the destroyer, who's the king of the abyss. The abyss is the realm where demons are constrained and punished till the day of judgment. You want any more proof? What about outer, outer darkness? Well, here you go. What is outer darkness or darkness that he was afraid to descend to? Matthew 8, 12. And we'll wrap it up for part two. We'll wrap it up for part two. Matthew 8, 12. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, their men will weep and gnash their teeth. Do you see how much truth there is in the Hebrew Bible regarding the afterlife, that there's life beyond the grave? And at that time, everyone went to the underworld, the netherworld called Sheol, Hades. Some were in, part, in torment. Some were in pain and misery. Some were in the pit. Others were not. They're in a state of peace. And I did a session on that not too long ago. Is it clear as day? If it is, we are officially done with part two. Lord willing, I may do part three sometime later, way late in the night or Friday. But I have to also get back to the Jehovah's Witness proving that Jesus is Jehovah. Right? Is it clear? So don't be deceived by modern translations. Don't be deceived by cult groups that say soul sleep. It is a lie from the pit of hell, pun intended. All the New Testaments overwhelmingly prove that when you physically die, your soul spirit leaves, you're still alive and conscious either in torment or in peace. And now after Christ, he now has opened heaven, because heaven is a city for saints who die in union with the Lord to enter heaven. And it's a city. And in the city, you have a palace, a kingdom, where the triune God dwells. Everyone else will be outside it in that city, which is a garden, enjoying the pleasures of God until they descend with the Lord at his return, when he then raises their physical bodies and they inhabit their physical bodies now made immortal. That's the teaching of the Bible from beginning to end.